Coming up on the show tonight, vegan educator Ed Winters will be here. He's going to tell us about his new book, How to Argue with a Meat Eater and Win Every Time. <laughs> Lewis Schaefer cannot wait for that one. Ed Winters is a strong advocate of veganism who has become a best-selling author, a hugely successful public speaker, and a content creator whose videos have been viewed millions of times. Known as Earthling Ed, he has spoken at a string of top universities around the world, including Cambridge and Harvard, and his short film Milk, about the reality of the dairy industry, won an award this year. And uh, his debut book was a bestseller. His second is How to Argue with a Meat Eater, which will be released later this month. And Ed Winters joins me now. Welcome to the show, Ed. Thank you for having me. So, let's start with Chicken Run 2. Right. right, so this is a new film that's come out. Now, apparently, it is about uh, chickens being rescued uh, from a, well, I suppose, a battery farming situation where they would eventually be turned into nuggets. I think the subtitle of the film is Dawn of the Nuggets. I think that's right, yes. Yes. Do you think that that film is going to encourage more children to turn off meat? I mean, I think there's a good argument for it. But there again, Chicken Run came out 23 years ago or so. Um, and was a similar theme. So I'm not necessarily holding out hope that it'll change lots of minds, but I think it'll influence people into hopefully thinking a little bit more deeply about the origins of their food. I mean, is the problem that it's just it, people think the taste is too good? I think taste is the biggest driver. Yeah. Taste, habits, culture, I think all of those things are the biggest driver in why we continue to harm animals unnecessarily. Yes. Now, uh, in a way, I'm playing devil's advocate, advocate here because I am a vegetarian, but the point is uh, a lot of people will say, well, we have evolved as omnivores. You know, we as a species eat meat and vegetables. Even the formation of our teeth uh, is related to that. So why should we go against our nature, I suppose? Well, many herbivorous animals do have canine teeth. Now, I'm not saying that we're strictly herbivores necessarily, but I do think we have choice, and the evidence seems to suggest that quite strongly. So I think that when we look to our history, we've been opportunistic omnivores. We ate what we could to, su to survive. But now we live in a time where we have nutrition information and we have availability and accessibility of all different types of foods. So we actually have choice. And with choice comes the responsibility to make ethical decisions. So what is your key ethical argument? Is it really about animal rights? Yeah, I mean, the reason I went vegan and, and the main pillar of veganism, which I promote, is that of trying to reduce animal suffering and death. Because what we do to animals for food, we don't have to do. You know, we put 90% of pigs in gas chambers in this country. We take babies away from their mothers. We macerate newborn baby chicks in the, in the egg industry when they're male. So we do a whole host of truly terrible things to animals. And the important thing is we don't have to do those things. So we should stop doing them. So for you, an animal life is as valuable as a human life? Not necessarily, but an animal's life is worthy enough to not be reduced to a meal on my dinner plates. Now, it's interesting in your book. So your book is really uh, about rhetoric. It's about persuasion. You're talking about how to argue with a meat eater. Right. What are the key elements of your book? Can you give us any of the tips? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many uh, uh, vegans watch the show. Well, I hope, uh, yeah, maybe not so many. But um, the thing I always think is vegans often have an optics problem, right? And I know that viewers of this show may look at me as a vegan and think, well, a vegan activist is going to be judgmental and militant and forceful. And so I know that vegans have an optics problem. And I think that actually the way that we can create genuine conversations is by meeting each other where we're at and dissecting each other's views. Because I don't think the, the idea behind veganism is something we're all at odds at. Everyone here says that we're against animal cruelty. But how about we put that into practice and say, well, if it's wrong to kick a dog, surely it must be immoral to force a pig into a gas chamber so that's the threat that, of an animal. That's a very interesting approach. So you take the view that, and you're right, there is a consensus, isn't there? People are always outraged when an animal is harmed. Remember that footballer hurt that kitten, Absolutely. for instance. Like people, it's just a consensus. Yeah. So you can start from that point and sort of bring it out a little bit. Uh, but, but ultimately, will people be open to persuasion? Because it's such a big sort of uh, established way of life, isn't it? I mean, it's a hard task, don't get me wrong. Sometimes it feels like I'm, you know, rolling the rock up the hill to, to roll back down on top of me again. But I think ultimately people are well-intentioned, they do care about animals, and it's just about encouraging people to think more deeply about their food and to connect with the animals on their plate. So it's a hard task, but change is happening, and I am confident. So when you talk about the perception of vegans, right? Now, I, I think you're right. There have been, I've, I've seen some evidence of very militant uh, vegan behaviour, and I think a lot of people are concerned because it comes across sometimes as a bit authoritarian. In other words, the choices that they make about their own lifestyles, they want to impose on everyone else. Do you think that's right? Well, I don't think that's actually the case. I think vegans can be very you know, vocal, we can be passionate, but we can't force anyone to do anything. The decision that the audience makes tonight when they have dinner or breakfast tomorrow morning is a decision that they make. However, when we talk about authoritarianism, authoritarianism being forceful, when we buy meat, dairy and eggs, we're forcing animals to have their lives taken from them, to be mutilated, to be harmed, to be forcibly impregnated. If you compare a vegan and a non-vegan, the non-vegan's far more forceful because a non-vegan 
makes animals, tens of billions of animals every single year, suffer terribly for the food choices they make. But as a vegan activist, do you ever despair at some of the tactics of some of your colleagues? I mean, some, sometimes, for instance, Peter, I can see, uh, sure. c- can be quite extreme in the way they approach certain things, and they, they almost become self-satirising. And I'm not sure if they're helping their own cause by taking that approach. No, I think there are definitely some tactics which aren't necessarily overall helpful. But the word extreme is interesting. I think the language we use is quite telling. Again, I think to cause harm to someone else is the extreme position. And some tactics may not be there very effective to everyone. But when we view these words and we look at the origins of them, we think about what the word extreme means. Well, it's far more extreme to force animals into gas chambers than it is to stand on the street with a provocative placard telling people to stop. Have you had any success in converting carnivores to the uh, herbivorous life? I mean, I, I hope so. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had people signing up to different things, people leave me nice messages. Obviously, it's hard to get a, a true gauge of the influence that you know, we as individuals have, but certainly I think there's been a lot of changes, and, hopefully, as a consequence of my work. And is that why you've, you've chosen to write this book? Yeah I, mean, uh, it, yeah, I mean, a lot of the work that I do is centred around conversations, public speaking, and so I've had an opportunity to stress test a lot of my arguments, meet people from all different walks of life, hunters, yes. farmers, ranchers, whoever it may be, and have conversations like what we're having now. And so it's It's really about putting that information into a book and hopefully giving it to a vegan or a non-vegan. And at the end of it, hopefully they have a more favourable impression of veganism. I mean, I'd be very fascinated to see you talking to someone who makes their living from uh, the the farming industry. Uh, And perhaps I should have invited someone from that perspective as well. But have you had many of those direct conversations or is it mostly a kind of online thing? Oh, I've had many direct conversations on TV, you know, on the streets and in different, in different formats. And so I've had many conversations with farmers, some farmers who, you know, passionately disagreed, but we had good conversations. We met a lot of common ground. And also farmers, I've met farmers who used to farm animals who've now transitioned out of that. And so there is a little transition happening even within the farming community. And importantly, we can still have productive and effective conversations even with people who fundamentally disagree with us. I think that's really important to be able to disagree agree politely and to get somewhere civilly and maybe to end up persuading someone. Um, but I, I just imagine, I mean, maybe it's my prejudice about farmers, but I imagine they'd be quite annoyed uh, by you and that they do get annoyed by vegans generally. Well, sometimes, and I think it's understandable. I mean, vegans are in a way criticising what they do, quite passionately, of course, and we're asking for them to change. And so I can understand why a farmer might feel that way. But ultimately, what we all want, farmer, vegan, whoever, is a world which is you know, more sustainable, where we can produce more food to feed more people at a more accessible and affordable price. And veganism is that. So actually, it's about encouraging farmers to reevaluate the way they look after land, the way that they make their money. And ultimately, we can create a transition to a fairer and more equitable food system together. So what about the farmers who will say to you, but we go out of our way to ensure that uh, the, the animals are only killed humanely and that they are looked after throughout their life and that there's no situation where, where cruelty is, is exercised. I understand your point that in some circumstances there is a horrible cruelty uh, in abattoirs and the like. But some farmers will say absolutely not. They do not do that. Do you accept that that's the case? No, absolutely not. Because the word humane means having or showing compassion or benevolence. Is it compassionate to cut someone's throat? Is it benevolent to force someone into a gas chamber and take their life from them? Do you draw a distinction, though, between the, some very bad practices in terms of the slaughter of animals and the, and the maintenance of animals and those who do try to pursue what they describe as the more humane approach? Well, the legal regulated standards are horrifically cruel. They're the ones that allow forced mutilations, the impregnations of animals, the separations of babies, gas chambers. All of these things are regulated by law. Sure, on some farms there may be animals who are kicked and punched. But well, I'm the thinking legal of things like regul- foie gras and where, you know, where, where that's a form of torture. Yeah, but yeah. all animal products are a form of torture. And we think about what happens to these animals when we look at the legal regulated practices. Foie gras is terrible, but what we do in this country to the animals here is also terrible. The things that we do legally as well as illegally. So actually, I think that when you look at the word humane, what's more humane, to kill or not to kill? How successful do you think you will be? I mean, where are we at the moment in terms of numbers? Like, how many, I know that there's been an upsurge of veganisms and people moving to plant-based diets. Do you have any sense of, of, of how much of an increase we've seen? I mean, it's hard to know what population, um, you know, growth is and different things. Generally, polling shows an upward trend. It's hard to know exactly what that translates, translates to in real terms. What we are seeing, I think, strongly, is an uptake in people becoming more conscious and aware. And even this word flexitarian gets banded around a lot. I don't necessarily know how it applies to the everyday person. But what I think we are seeing is a growing shift towards people thinking more consciously about their food choices and ultimately making changes. Okay, well, Ed Winter's book is called How to Argue with a Meat Eater, and that is available now, I believe. Is that right? It's published on the 28th of December, but it's available for pre-ordering now. Fantastic. Ed, thanks so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thank you.